All right. Which one of you did this? It's time to pull the 328D Touring in the shop for a suspension refresh and a new CV axle. I'm gonna get cleaned up here for a little bit, pull the car in, and we're gonna get to work. All right, so now that we got all the parts laid out, let's go ahead and go through them, talk about what we're putting on the car and why. The DIYs for how to do this stuff on your car will be split up into different videos, oil change, suspension, axle, fuel filter, and cabin air filter. So there should be four or five different videos. This is specific for the F31 wagon. They make lots of different springs from lots of different manufacturers for the sedan. But for the wagon, I had to go to iBock, go through the forums and get a specific part number. I will post that part number for you guys uh, down below if you're interested in finding lowering springs for your wagon that don't lower it by a lot. For me, I use a trailer hitch on this car. Uh, we go camping with this car. As you can see, it's pretty dirty. This is the daily that's supposed to do everything. So I didn't want it to go much lower and I'm going to measure to see what the height is right now. And then in a week from now, once the suspension has settled, I'm gonna measure again and we'll see how much it's actually dropped. For those springs, which should lower it by about half an inch to an inch, like I said, not very much, we are gonna be using these Coney Special Active Struts. I tried to order these from FCP Euro. Unfortunately, even though they were on their website and they said in stock, nine days after my order was placed, I said, hey guys, where's my tracking number? And they said, whoops, we actually don't have any of those and your order has been stuck in the system because of that. So I had to order these from ID Parts. ID Parts is the website I used to go to all the time before I had this diesel when I had my old 2001 Volkswagen diesel. The plates are still up on the wall there from when I had that car. Great website, especially for diesel vehicles. Back to FCP Euro. That's where I got all this stuff. This is gonna be our dust boots. Um, this is our uh, cabin air filter, fuel filter. This car has 125,000 kilometers, so about 80,000 miles. I'm expecting this set of suspension to last about another 100,000. And honestly, I would still like to own this car at that point. So if I have to replace it all again, FCP Euro lifetime replacement guarantee. So I won't have to pay for all this stuff, which amounts to around $400 US. Those are all the parts. Now let's go ahead and get started with the suspension. For sake of time, this video does not explain how to properly jack up your F3X or F2X car. Safe to say though, this is a really important part of the procedure where you really don't want to screw up because if you do, it could ruin your life and we definitely don't want that to happen. Check out another video on how to properly jack up your car if you have any doubts or questions at all. Jacked up, wheels off, hood up, and whatever that plastic stuff over there is called off. One thing you have to understand about most cars like these is that the struts are fastened to the top of the vehicle with several bolts that you can see once you open the hood and usually fastened to the actual steering knuckle or the hub assembly with one or two big bolts down at the bottom. In the case of this car, we've got one bolt right through the knuckle and a nut on this side and classic BMW, it's an 18 millimeter head with a 16 millimeter nut. The 
before we drop it down from the top, we've got to take care of this sway bar link, which is attached to the strut assembly over here. And it looks like it's got a Torx bit counter hold. And take that sway bar link off of the strut. With the sway bar link disconnected from the 16 millimeter nut that was up here, I'm just gonna zip tie it now to the brake line so that it's out of our way while we're working on the strut. Now, trust me guys, I used to skip steps like these. Now you have a nice clear workspace and the rest of the job will go much smoother. These two lines coming out of the chassis right here, this wheel speed sensor, which goes down all the way from over there down into your hub on this side. And then there's this, which is the brake pad wear sensor that goes into your brake caliper. Now this here coming out of the chassis on this side, which is like the front of the vehicle, on this side going into this bracket on the side of the strut, this is actually welded to the strut. So that can't be taken off. And it looks like that wire connects to a sensor here or a connector of some kind. And then the other wire goes all the way over here. And Okay guys, the first plug was not too bad. It just unplugged from the bottom of this uh, sensor or switch. And then the second one over here was a little harder because it's underneath this little bracket and hard to get to. I pressed that little switch in with the pliers. And then I used my other hand and just pulled down on the looping wire and it just pulled right out, okay? So now those two wires for the electronic suspension are disconnected. The hub bolt is disconnected. The sway bar link is disconnected and the bracketry for all the other lines and sensors are disconnected. So the only thing holding the strut in the vehicle now is up on top. Okay guys, so I wouldn't normally use an impact on this sort of thing, but these are non-reusable bolts anyway, so we're replacing them and we're replacing these struts. So if something were to strip out, it's not like I'm too concerned about the strut. We also have to remove this strut mount bar or this uh, strut support bar with a 16 millimeter. <laughs> and finally guys, when you lift up this rubber trim here, you'll see that this piece of plastic is attached to the top of the strut mount. So you just wanna get something like a little pry bar like the one I have here. And you're gonna wanna just stick it under the edge and just gently lift up and pop it out and that's really easy. Now you can see in here, there's another Torx hold down and another nut that's for attaching your strut to the strut mount. So it'll look pretty much the same as this. That's the new strut. We would only wanna take that apart if we were reusing the strut mounts, but we have brand new ones. Now, this is very important. As the strut comes out, it could nick your fenders and that could start some rust. We definitely don't want that to happen. And that's why a lot of times you'll see people actually put masking tape along the top of their wheel arches. I'm gonna skip that step and just go very carefully and make sure I don't touch my fender or scratch my paint. I have to stop now and grab my strut spreader tool for the knuckle. So I'm gonna take a little piece of paper towel, rest it in between my fender and the top of the strut mount. And then I'm just gonna let it rest there while I grab that tool. This says it's for VW Audi, but it should work for our application. This is a spreader tool. If you don't buy one of these and you try going in there with a chisel and a hammer and a pry bar, your life will be miserable. If you do buy one of these, you simply insert it, spin it, and it opens up the hub so that you can remove the strut. And just like that, it's out. So I've got the strut spreader tool in here. I'm gonna pull the camera off and show you. So see how it's the wide way right now? That's because you insert it the narrow way, and then you turn the ratchet like so, 
the opposite of that, right? So as you spin it around, right there, it's gonna lock and then we spin it so that it opens up the knuckle and then it's gonna close it again like that. So once it opened it up, I put my foot against the caliper and I just pulled straight out. Okay guys, so now that we have one strut out of the vehicle, basically you wanna take all of your new parts and lay it out beside it just to try to mirror what you took out of the car. So first of all, we see here that we've got a bracket with an inset on this side, and this bracket has an inset. But if we look at the other side, if we were to try to use this shock, which is the wrong side, you can see if we flipped it over so that the bracket was on the correct side, now it's no longer inset, it's actually flush. So you know that this is for the other side of the vehicle. Okay, then we've also got this piece. We want to mirror it with that piece. We've got the boot. We've got the mount, the gasket. This gasket material is the exact same uh, shape with the same holes as the top of the strut mount. So I checked right away to see if it was stuck up in the top of the chassis and it's not, which um, I kind of find odd. So maybe this vehicle never came with them for demonstration purposes, for those of you who will be reusing your top hats or strut mounts, this is how you want to do it. With a spring compressor, and then of course a Torx hold down and a through ratchet, through wrench, maybe a crow's foot on another ratchet, something so that you can get the T30 through the top. This is how you're going to remove that strut mount. Unless of course you like living dangerously. I went ahead and removed all of this stuff anyway from the first strut. Now putting the new stuff side by side, we should have a dust boot. You should have the bump stop that presses right into the strut mount. And you should have the strut mount. So all your new stuff should look the same. Dust boot. Here's the much shorter strut mount. You can see the difference. Okay, so the first strut is all back together now. For tightening the top nut down, I did put the spring compressors back on to take the torque off of the actual threads because I wanted to be able to put a torque wrench on top. Turns out I tightened this down basically until it felt like it bottomed out and I didn't push it past there. Release the spring compressors and just by checking, you know, there's definitely a th few threads visible there and you should be able to pull down on this and not see too much of a gap in there. If this is wobbling around, if the spring can go up and down freely, then you've got to go tighter on the top hat. And uh, if it's if it's somewhat tight in there, you don't want a lot of preload on it. You just want just enough that it can't uh, shake around. So this is ready for reinstallation in the car. So now I've got the spreader socket back in its place, opening hub, a new shot going in. Let's get her done. Hi, it's me again. Remember when I said you didn't want to get caught in a position where you had to use a chisel and a hammer and all that junk to get your shock back in your car or to get it out? Well, here I am hammering away. The unfortunate thing is that spreader tool was just not thick enough to help me get the new struts in. I guess they're a little thicker than the old ones were. We pried against it, hit it from the top, taped a hockey puck to the top so that the hammer wouldn't damage the strut mount, and boy oh boy, this took several hours just to get it in here. I finally figured out at the end there was a chisel I had in my garage that I could sort of hammer in there and just uh, use it in place of the spreader tool, but um, it's a learning process, so what can I say? This part sucked. I ended up putting masking tape on the fender because we were in there with so many tools I didn't want to scratch it, and uh, it's a bit of a nightmare, so hopefully the other side goes better. So guys, it's been a long couple hours getting the one strut into the vehicle. Um, two things I would advise doing this job again. One is that maybe you leave the strut connected to the top of the vehicle and drop the spindle out first instead of doing it the other way around. And two, no matter what you do, you're gonna have to take off the undercarriage, which is all those eight millimeter bolts underneath. 
that's the plastic cover underneath your motor. You need to take that out so that you can take this piece of plastic here out. And you need to do all of that just to loosen off the thrust arm and the other control arm down below. You need to loosen those off. I think those are 18 millimeters. And the reason you need to do that is because those are preloaded bushings. If you don't loosen those off, you will not be able to bend your spindle low enough to get it back in the vehicle. Now, I don't know for the life of me how I got the old one out, but I can't get the new one back in. But even with all this tape there protecting it, I put ratchet straps on it and I did everything. I couldn't make it clear this fender without causing significant damage. So uh, I basically had to uh, figure out what else to do drop those uh, control arms a little bit on the inside. I also removed the tie rod. I've got new tie rod ends to do anyway. So, I mean, this job kind of turned into a bit of a nightmare to be honest. Um, I would definitely try loosening those control arms at the chassis before you do anything. All right guys, the front struts are done. So now it's time to do the back going to be a lot simpler than the fronts were should take about an hour maybe two hours on your first one and an hour on the second one it's really not that bad so let's go ahead and jump into it i'll show you the tools you need first and then we'll get at it so we've got our new rear spring our new rear shock our shock mount our shock mount gasket top bolt for the shock three torx bolts to mount the shock mount to the chassis a new bump stop, cordless impact, pneumatic impact, the torque sockets we need, which are an E20 and an E12, and an 18 millimeter, we might need a 21 millimeter, and we definitely need a 10 millimeter. The 10 millimeter is used for the first step, which is to take off these plastic undershields from underneath the control arms. Once you've removed that splash shield and taken the nut off the outside two bolts, get a jack, put it underneath the control arm, and jack it up until the bolts want to remove themselves freely. This often takes a little bit of trial and error, just trying to feel around to where it's lined up enough for it to come out without too much resistance. The back shocks are so easy, we're almost done already. Now we just move to the shock mount at the top. Use your E socket and just remove it like that. Pretty simple, there's only three of them. Here's the old springs and the new springs side by side. As you can see, they're really not that much shorter, about the width of the roll of electrical tape. But they are a fair bit thicker, probably one or two millimeters thicker. So the first thing we did is transfer over the hardware to the new spring. Now we're gonna mount the new spring into the spring perch with that little uh, pointy object in the correct spot on the actual spring perch. And just as a note, these springs do come with these um, rubber spacers that you can put on top of the spring if you want, like so, up inside of the spring mount on the chassis. This will give you about another half an inch of height. I am not going to put that on because I feel like that would actually make these springs about the same length as the old ones with the new thickness and the extra coil. I think it would actually sit higher than the previous springs. 
Um, this might be ideal if you're using your wagon for towing and utility a lot, but let's be honest guys, this is a five-year-old BMW. It's still a really nice car. I still want it to look like a sport wagon, not a uh, old Volkswagen wagon that you throw firewood in the back of. Um, it's a nice car, so let's get that um, let's get that flush fitment a little bit. And if it's too low, then uh, you can always put the spacer back in in probably about half an hour. With the new bump stop on the shock and the shock mount, now I want to use a five millimeter Allen key to hold the strut in place and a 17 millimeter through ratchet. I'm just going to tighten this mount down. If you want to stop and check it, see if there's any play. Listen to this. That play means we still need to keep going. Get it a little tighter. No more play. It feels pretty tight. So now I'm going to take the bump stop and the dust mount push it up inside and put the new gasket on top. Now if you'll notice, there's this plastic piece on top. I did order new ones, but they actually don't fit on the new shocks. So I'm just gonna leave those off. To get this inside the car, it's often easier if you push down a little bit to shorten it. Now that it's short, compressed, it'll come uncompressed in a few seconds, but if we go kind of quick, we can get it in the car, no problem. And there it goes on its way back up, but it's already in, so the hard part's done. Now we just need to bolt it back in place like we did before. up it's been about six weeks since i got the coney shocks and struts and the eibach springs installed on my f31 we're going to do a follow-up right now and talk about how the ride height has settled and how the suspension feels so first of all the install on the front was a little bit challenging i showed you guys a video on how to do the front driver's corner i ended up doing the front passenger corner a totally different way i explained that a little earlier in the video Basically, what you're gonna to wanna to do is almost the opposite of what I showed you guys. So instead of putting the shock body into the knuckle and then trying to fit the knuckle back under the fender, what you're gonna to wanna to do is mount the shock to the vehicle and then slide the knuckle and the spindle up into so that the shock sits inside of it. It's kind of hard to describe, but that way worked for me a lot better. Maybe you'll try something else. Either way, the key with both methods is definitely loosening off that thrust arm and the control arm which i talked about in the middle of the video now as for ride height and ride performance i just got done measuring the front the front measurement i believe was about 26 and 11 30 seconds we can go back to earlier in the video to compare but i know it's dropped about an inch and a third at the front so i'm really happy with the way this looks it's not too low i haven't scraped on anything personally my wife claims she scraped something once, but I don't see anything too bad. So fingers crossed, nothing was actually damaged. And then at the back, we didn't drop an inch and a third, which is great because this is a wagon. I tow with it. I want to have the ride height at the back that if I put a trailer on the back, it doesn't bottom right out. So here we've actually only dropped about an eight tenths of an inch so maybe three quarters of an inch somewhere in there definitely less than a full inch very mild drop at the back a little bit more aggressive at the front but really it's that extra half an inch you need at the front to eliminate the crazy reverse rake that we always get going on with bmw x drive vehicles uh, overall the performance is you know it's not bad it feels like the original suspension felt in sport mode except now the EDC is coated out. There's no more EDC. So whether you're in Eco Pro, Comfort or Sport, it feels the same in all modes because the suspension is not affected. 
My only real complaint is that there's a little bit more body roll now than there was before. And I'm guessing that's because as ugly as that front wheel gap is on the X drive, BMW sets it up that way for a reason. I think the rear wheel drive beamers would probably be fine, but the X drive, now that it's dropped a little bit, just isn't quite performing as well. Now this is my daily, it's not a track weapon. So if it doesn't corner perfectly, it's okay. I can mess with that later if I really want to dial it in. For now, I'm pretty happy with it, considering what I spent on all that suspension, way better than buying all that OEM EDC stuff. So thanks for tuning in. I hope you learned a thing or two about how to install your suspension, or maybe how to not install your suspension. Come back again for more videos at High School Teacher on YouTube, and some more cool content here and there on Instagram at High School Teacher. We'll see you next time.